doing a ho-ho plan and my tail was really sharp and then all of a sudden my board came down and just blam! Cut my fingers right off, man. Kids be looking like this. Like, it's like, so yeah, don't do street plans or ho-ho plans. But the true story is that I was uh, smart enough to figure out how to, when I was 13, make an elevator go down one floor without the doors closing and dumb enough to walk out onto the roof of the elevator and ride around in the elevator on the roof. And then even dumber, to get bored with that and then climb around in some of the equipment and the machinery that was whatnot. And so one dumb decision led to another. I was riding on the weight, which is just insane. And, and I had to climb on the wires to keep my hands from going into the wheel, you know. I didn't really thought through this one and my hands went bang into the wheel. And the elevator should have really just kept going. I mean, it should be strong enough to just crush my whole arm. I should have slipped off the ledge and just kind of fallen. Whatever was stuck should have ripped and I should have just crashed into the elevator, you know. But somehow, it stopped the elevator machinery and I didn't fall and I was hanging on there, you know, and I'm just stuck like this. So then I'm trying to call for someone to throw up a wrench so I can disassemble the wheel. Because I'm thinking, I'm going to get in so much trouble when I get home, you know, my mom's going to kill me. And I was stuck up there for like 45 minutes until the fire department, paramedics, cops showed up. It was like a big deal, you know. It was so much pain for one second and then there wasn't any. And my hand was mangled. It was like taking a sledgehammer and just beating the crap out of your hand. And when I got out, it was laying on my, on my, I had a white shirt on. And it wasn't bleeding. There was only a few spots of blood on my shirt, you know. I mean, they were like, they looked like ground beef. They would not, look looked like a horror movie. And then I was out for like two days and I woke up in a white room. Everything was white. And I thought I had died. I'm like, wow, oh, okay, I died, you know, I'm like. And then I see my arm like in a huge package. I'm like, oh, my, all right, maybe I didn't die. I'm in a hospital. Okay. I skate with rails so I have a better grab, you know, like, because if I'm going to do a McTwist, I need a little bit better grab than just having a board, you know, where your hand slips off, so. I'm lucky to be alive, so I don't really, you know, the fact that I can ride a skateboard also, you know, awesome. Oh, tons. Are you kidding me? When you come from another country and you understand what the American dream, what the American experience is, you have a different perspective than you, than you ever could if you grew up here. It's, by every imaginable measure, this is, this is the most prosperous, free, successful civilization that humankind has ever assembled in the history of, of man, in my opinion. I haven't done a McTwist in a few years, and I did one on my 40th birthday. I definitely am looking at, you know, the 540 at 50 as something I'm going to do. Oh my god, that thing was a nightmare. That was a Mike Ternansky creation. He what? made us wear it. So there was this crazy t-shirt. It was called a bat t-shirt because I had a logo that was sort of the bat logo and, and it had like a tail to it, a tuxedo t-shirt almost, right? And then it was cut short in the front. It was cut off all the way around and just, you know, it didn't have like a t-shirt edge to it. It was like it was a ripped t-shirt because that Christian used to cut t-shirts like that. And then he had some crazy neck without a real collar that had a cut right here, you know, so sort of a weird V-neckish. And it was all Mike's idea. Those things sold like crazy for a hot little minute right there. But what he said about that t-shirt, you actually just once again proved true. Because it's 30 years later and we're talking about the flipping bat t-shirt, you know, like that's exactly what Mike Ternansky was about. Doing stuff like that that he knew was gonna somehow last forever. Because I don't think I'm ever gonna live down that bat t-shirt. The funny part about the D3 is, you know, when we first got it, like, yeah, it's kind of ugly, you know, I'm not sure about this. And Dave liked it well enough for some reason, so cool, we'll put it out there. So it sold all right first season, you know, all right second season, and it started dropping off. So about a year, we're going into the next spring season, and we're like, okay, well, time to drop this one, right? Sales started going like this a little bit, you know. And we didn't have a lot of new stuff that season, so we're like, well, let it ride one more, and then we'll drop it the next one. And in that fourth season, that thing just went blonk for reasons that I don't even really know. It's insane. We used to put limitations on shops that you can only place 50% of your order as D3s. The one that sold even better than the D3 was the D3 2001. Well, once we saw that, we, that this was something that was working, so we teched it out way more, you know? We, we took a bad thing and made it much worse. It's been said that it's the best selling skate shoe of all time, which first, it's not a skate shoe really. Like seriously, come on. And obviously Vance is the best selling skate shoe, but it might have set some records over, you know, best selling shoot from a skate company right. over a period of time. I mean, I've had, I've had people come up to me, skate shops and what, and be like, dude, thanks so much, man. Like, you just paid for my house, you know? From the D3? From, yeah, from the D3.
We had an idea, we had this vision. We were trying to make skateboarding be about just what we were doing. And at that time, you know, most skate companies were owned by guys in suits. They were legitimate businesses, they were corporations. And our whole idea was to, to not do it that way. That a skate company should be owned, it should be run, the vision should be managed by, you know, it should be designed by, it should be about guys that skate. Danny was on, I don't know how many companies in a month time there. He was on Santa Cruz for a weekend. He was on Powell a couple different times, you know. I think he was on H-Shoot a couple different times too. Couldn't even keep track of it. So now that it's 20 years later, I really actually can't recount it. Everybody knew he was good, but Danny knew, Danny knew he was good. Danny knew what he wanted. You know, I mean, you've seen his career. He's not only is he a smart person, he's a very, he's very visionary. He knows what he wants. And you know, he was only 14 at the time. So he might not have been that clear on exactly what he wanted, but he knew he wanted something and, and he was very actively pursuing it in a way that I've actually never seen a 14 year old do since then. When Mike and I were sitting there thinking about like where we were at with Danny, you know, like where were we getting him, where we're not, was this gonna work? out we'd kind of given up on it and we were going to Houston uh, we were going to the contest and uh, kind of out of the blue we get a call from Dan he's like dude I want to well, I think something had happened with Powell somebody had said something wrong to him or who knows what and uh, he, he came with us he's like yeah we'll get you a ticket we're leaving tomorrow type of thing you know it was it was that random and he jumped on on the trip with us you know I won the pro contest he won the am contest maybe at that point you know like he saw that we were about to do something that was revolutionary in a way, you know. That footage is in the video, like that's it that you see right there. I mean, it just came together like that, you know. I had not won a pro contest ever in my career. It was actually a tie between me and uh, Brian Pennington. Like the final score was a tie and you know, it's Texas, shut up and skate. It's kind of chaotic anyway. And the judges had kind of dispersed and they figured out that there was a tie, like, oh, what do we do, you know? And the judge was like, ah, give it to Mag. You know, like, I, it was that random. <laughs> <laughs> but that also proves another theory I have on skateboard, especially skateboard contest. And here it is. For all the skateboarders out there that ever want to be in a contest, right? If you want to be judged fairly, don't enter a skateboard contest. It just doesn't work that way. And I say that having been on both sides of that fence. It was tough. It's easily the toughest time of my life. Just dealing with adversity in a way that I'd never experienced. I'd always looked at my life as really pretty easy, you know. Sure, I lived in a car when I came here from Sweden, but I was in California riding skate parks, you know, like, I didn't care that I lived in a car. For me, it was Christmas every day. You know? And when H Street took off, I was traveling the world with some of the best skateboarders, and you know, skateboarding was big, and we are doing these big demos, and yeah, life was awesome, you know. Like, so yeah, when that happened, it was rough. I wasn't anywhere near ready to, to deal with that. Especially with, uh, you know, like, Mike Ternansky was, he was such a smart guy that having him against you was not something I was ready for in the least. Well, once again, to tell you the honest truth, you know, like I spent a year thinking about how I could kill that guy, so it was a little rough. You know, obviously I had no interest in going to prison, so I was trying to devise all these really clever plans, you know. And obviously I was never going to act out on that or anything, but you know, like that's pretty much where my mindset was at. It was yeah. tough. And I was really pissed off when he died that I couldn't only experience sadness you know, over someone that I knew and, and cared for a lot, you know, dying. In some ways, I had to experience like, like, wow, okay, well, you got yours, you know, that's what you get kind of a thing, you know. And you never really want to feel that when somebody dies, you know, no matter how rotten they've been to you. Death is permanent, it never comes back, you know. And I would actually give a lot to have Mike T sit over here if for no other reason other than I'd sock him real hard and, and then, you know, let's go have a beer together or something, you know. And, and quite honestly, Mike, Mike had made uh, a few efforts of apologizing to me and uh, you know and he'd done that in private with me and he also did it in public a couple of times you know like so in, in, in some ways we had kind of made up to a, de to a degree you know but it was rough you know like it took me 10 years just to kind of get my life back and career back so it was crazy. That was literally the best thing I've ever seen. People can claim bullshit on it or whatever but I've seen people are just like dude Cardiel's like stoked you did that like